Hi, I'm Mark Barsamian with the Ohio University Math Department. In this video, I'll be discussing abstract geometries. I'll be discussing the definition of abstract geometry, some models of abstract geometries, and then additional terminology involving points and lines, collinear and non-collinear sets of points, distinct lines, intersecting lines and parallel lines, and then I'll discuss two recurring questions in geometry. This material is produced for Math 3110, 5110, College Geometry here at Ohio University. The material for this video is from section 2.1 of the book Geometry, a Metric Approach with Models by Millman and Parker. More specifically, pages 17 to 21. The corresponding homework is this collection of exercises from section 2.1 start with a definition of abstract geometry. An abstract geometry is an ordered pair of two things, script P and script L. We call the ordered pair script A for abstract geometry. Script P denotes a set whose elements are called points, and script L denotes a, a, a non-empty set whose elements are called lines. And lines are sets of points that satisfy these two requirements that are called axioms. For every two distinct points in the set of points, there exists at least one line in the set of lines such that the two points are elements of that line. Remember, lines are sets of points. Axiom 2 says for every line in the set of lines, there are at least two distinct points that are elements of that line. This, of course, should be script L. The set of lines is a script thing. So there's some additional terminology. We say these words, P lies on L or L passes through P, uh, in situations where the letter P is a, is a point and the letter L denotes a line. And what it simply means is that point P is an element of that line L. Requirements 1 and 2 are called the abstract geometry axioms. They're simply the requirements that the sets P and L must satisfy, in addition to L being non-empty, in order for that pair to be qualified to be called an abstract geometry. Now, a couple of uh, remarks about what I think is a mistake in the book's definition of abstract geometry. Here's the book's definition. There's some subtle differences between the book's definition in the red box and my definition in the green box. Notice that my definition contains the qualifiers distinct points and at least one line. For every two distinct points, there's at least one line. Notice also that in my definition, an abstract geometry is presented as an ordered pair, whereas in the book's definition, an abstract geometry is presented as a set. Now here there's a typo. In the book's definition, there's a, a set, P comma L. The use of ordered pairs, or more generally, n-tuples, is more standard in math. The character denoting the set of points must be on the left in the ordered pair. And the symbol denoting the set of lines on the right. More importantly, I feel the use of the phrase non-empty in the book's definition is a mistake for two reasons. The book's definition says there's a collection L of non-empty subsets of P that are called lines. The first reason that I feel that's a mistake is this. Axiom 2 will ensure that each line will be a non-empty subset. Axiom 2 says every line has at least two points. So we don't need to say that the lines are non-empty subsets because we already are going to have this axiom that requires that. Now that's just some redundancy, but you'll see in our book that the, our, the book is very spare in its presentation. There's never any redundancy. So the fact that there is redundancy in that definition, I think is a sign that that definition is, has, has a mistake in it. More importantly, if the set P contains a single point A, and script L is the empty set that contains no lines, then this thing would satisfy the book's definition. That is, the book's definition does not require that there be any lines at all. 
On the other hand, notice that the use of the phrase non-empty in my definition, my definition says that the set script L is non-empty. That means there is at least one line in that set. So that use of the word non-empty in my definition allows us to prove a theorem. An abstract geometry must contain at least one line and at least two distinct points. Uh, and so you can see the proof is kind of a no-brainer. Uh, suppose you have an abstract geometry. Well, there's at least one line because that's written in the definition. This, the, the set script L is a non-empty set. And then there are at least two points on that line by, uh, by axiom 2. Axiom 2 says each line contains at least two points. So because of those problems with the book's definition of abstract geometry, the definition in the red box, I, I'm not going to use that definition in our course. I'll use my definition. That's the definition in the green box. Next topic is models of abstract geometry. A model for abstract geometry is simply an example of a pair, script P, script L, that satisfies the definition of abstract geometry. The book presents three examples of abstract geometries in section 2.1, the Cartesian plane, the Poincaré plane, and the Riemann sphere. But I'm going to start with simpler models, what I call finite geometries. There's nothing in the definition of abstract geometry that says there must be an infinite set of points. Indeed, it's possible for a pair, P, L, to qualify as an abstract geometry with only a finite set of points. So I'm going to define a finite geometry uh, to mean an abstract geometry in which the set of points, script P, is a finite set. So for an example, let's consider some finite sets that may or may not qualify to be called abstract geometries. Example 1a, consider this pair. Script P is this set of five points, A, B, C, D, E. And the lines are these sets of two points. Remember, a, a line is a set of points. The line that contains points A and C is denoted in this picture by that segment. Now here's a typo. There's not meant to be the set containing A and E. Uh, the line containing B and D is shown here. So the question is, is that ordered pair, script P, script L, qualified to be called an abstract geometry? Explain why or why not. Well, let's look at the abstract geometry axioms. The abstract geometries are, for every two distinct points, there must exist at least one line that contains those two points. And also, abstract geometry 2 says, for every line, there must be at least two distinct points that lie on that line. So we see that this pair, script P, comma, script L, flunks the test to be qualified to be called an abstract geometry. For instance, there is no line that passes through B and C. But notice that our our pair, script P, comma, script L, does satisfy axiom 2. Every line does contain at least two points. So this example is not an abstract geometry. Let's go on. What about example 2? This pair. This set of points, A, B, C, D, E, this should be uh, just A, B, C, D. And this set of lines, well, they're illustrated in this diagram. So our question is, is that qualified to be called an abstract geometry? Explain why or why not. Well, it is qualified to be an abstract geometry. Now, officially, to, to justify that, we, we should go through each pair of points. So for instance, points A and B lie on that line. Then we have to go through all pairs like that. Points A and C lie on that line. Points 
A and D lie on that line. So we would have to do that for each pair, but uh, it's, it's clear enough to just say it this way. And similarly, we can just simply uh, say that it satisfies axiom one. We don't have to go through all six lines and say that line contains two points, that line contains two points, and so forth. We can just say this. So this example is an abstract geometry. Go on. What about this example? The set of points is the set with four letters, A, B, C, D. Now they're illustrated in this diagram uh, in the following way. This could be A, B, C, D. The set of lines is this set of sets of points. So one line passes through A and B. That's that blue set. Notice there's one line that passes through three points. That dotted thing is is one line. Is this qualified to be called an abstract geometry? Explain why or why not. Well, here we should be careful. Uh, what about points A and B? Well, yes, there's a line that passes through A and B. What about uh, A and C? Yeah, there's a line that passes through A and C. What about A and D? Yeah, there's a line that passes through A and D. What about B and C? Well, let's see. There's a line that passes through B and C. Good. What about B and D? Well, that same line passes through B and D. That's okay. What about C and D? Well, that same line passes through C and D. So it satisfies axiom one. What about axiom two? Does every line contain at least two points? Yes, three of the lines contain exactly two points. One of the lines contains three points. That's okay, there's nothing that says that lines have to all have the same number of points, and certainly lines have, do not have to just contain exactly two points, they, they just need to contain at least two. So this is an abstract geometry. Let's go on. Example D, what about this pair? The set of points is the same four points, and the set of lines is very similar to the set of lines in the previous example. These lines are the same lines from the previous example, but there's also this line, line BD. Is this qualified to be called an abstract geometry? Let's consider uh, whether this satisfies axiom one. For every pair of points, is there at least one line that both points lie on? Well, that's clearly true for the same pairs we discussed before, pair AB, pair AC, pair AD. Those are easy. But what about the pair of points B and D? We see there's a line that passes through B and D, the dotted thing. But there's also this line that passes through B and D. Well, that's okay. Let's go back up and look at the axioms. The definition of abstract geometry says that for every two distinct points, there is at least one line that both points lie on. It doesn't say there has to be exactly one. It, has said, it just says there has to be at least one. Points B and D both lie on that blue line, and points B and D both lie on this red line. Points C and D only lie together on this one line. So we see that um, axiom one is satisfied. And we see that axiom two is satisfied. Every line contains at least two points. And again, not all the lines have the same number of points, but that's okay. So this is an abstract geometry. Let's go on. Question E, consider this pair. The set of points uh, should be actually ABC. Now the set of lines contains just one line, the line that's the set containing ABC. So that dotted thing is a line. Is this qualified to be called an abstract geometry? Explain why or why not. Well, we have to think carefully about axiom one. Does every pair of points have a line that both points lie on? 
let's consider the pair A and B. Uh, is there a line that both A and B lie on? Yes, that red line. What about the pair A and C? Is there a line that both A and C lie on? Yes, the red thing. Finally, consider pair B and C. Is there a line that both B and C lie on? Yeah, the red thing. So every pair of points has a, at least one line they both lie on. So this satisfies axiom one. What about axiom two? Well, we see that every line has at least two points. So axiom two is satisfied. So this is an abstract geometry. That's the end of that example in which we considered finite geometries. Our next topic is the Cartesian plane. It's defined this way. It's the pair that has R2 on the left and a script L with a subscript capital E on the right. Now that pair is denoted by a script C for Cartesian. So the thing on the left, again that has to play the role of the set of points, that's the set R2, of ordered pairs of real numbers. The set L subscript E, so script L subscript capital E, can, is, uh, contains lines which are, are sets of points of two types. A vertical line is a set of this form. Remember, lines are sets of points. So a vertical line is going to be a set of ordered pairs of real numbers. So a vertical line is a line that's denoted by this symbol. Uh, an, a capital L with a subscript little a, and that's going to denote the set of ordered pairs, that is the ordered pairs of real numbers, with the property that the, the, the left coordinate, the x coordinate, is the letter a. So that's going to look like this. That's a vertical line. It has line equation x equals a. The second kind of line is called a non-vertical line. So it's a set containing ordered pairs of real numbers that satisfy an equation of that form, y equals mx plus b, where uh, this should say m and b are elements of the real numbers. And a non-vertical line is denoted by this symbol, capital L subscript m comma b. So here's a, an illustration of a, of a non-vertical line. Notice in this drawing we would label the y-intercept with these coordinates, and the slope is m. So there's a proposition proven in the book that the Cartesian plane satisfies the definition of abstract geometry. That is, the Cartesian plane is a model of abstract geometry. Now the authors provide a nice proof of this proposition on page 18 of the book. They present this material in the different order from the way I present it. In my presentation, I defined what I mean by the Cartesian plane, and then I would prove that uh, that, that thing, the Cartesian plane, is, is qualifies to be called a model of abstract geometry. The book presents things in this order. They first prove a bunch of stuff, and then based upon that, they define uh, th this thing to be the Euclidean plane or the Cartesian plane. Uh, it's basically synonymous. So that's a subtle thing, just that they, they present things in a different order. But I'm describing in my notes for this video uh, how there are a lot of things about the book's proof that make it hard to understand. The, the book's proof does not have numbered statements, does not have any kind of headings that indicate the proof structure, uh, and also there, there generally aren't justifications for the statements in the book's proof. Now this is typical for a book written at the level of our book. Authors assume that the reader is skilled in reading and writing proofs. Now, um, for students at the level of math 3110, 5110, uh, the, the students are often not that fluent in, in reading and writing proofs. So the book's proofs may initially be difficult for, for you to understand. Uh, but skills that you acquired in math 3050 or CS3000, discrete mathematics course, can help 
you make sense of the proofs. In most cases, the key to understanding the book's proofs is to consider what I would call in Math 3050 proof structure. In general, in, in these videos, I do not intend to duplicate proofs that are in the book with proofs written at a more in introductory level, but I, I will discuss in the notes for this video how, how you should read the book's proof of this proposition 2.1.1 and add structure to it, either mentally or on paper, and thereby make sense of it. That discussion of how to read that proof and make sense of it follows in these printed notes. Now, this uh, I discussed in a class meeting for Math 3110. It's actually kind of tedious to discuss verbally. There's a lot of stuff to read. So I think uh, what I will say is this. Read through these pages of the, of the printed notes that accompany this video, starting with this page. This is page 17 and continuing for quite a while to this page, page 23. So six or seven pages of, of, of notes discussing how you think about proof structure. You start with just the most basic of proof structure and then work your way to a complete proof. So here's a complete proof that the Cartesian plane satisfies the definition of abstract geometry. It's a page and a half of these notes. My point in this is that you should realize that reading the, the Millman and Parker book or any advanced math book entails a process like the one that I present in, in these six or seven pages of these notes. That is, when you read a proof in the book, you have to either mentally or on scrap paper add outline form and statement numbers, additional statements, and clear justifications. Um, once you get that skill of, of doing that, uh, you'll be a lot better at writing proofs and at reading proofs. Now, throughout the semester in our course, I'll occasionally assign a homework or a quiz or an exam problem that asks you to rewrite a given proof from the book, adding those things, adding outline form, statement numbers, additional statements, and clear justifications for each step. So much as I've done in these preceding pages from 17 on. Let's go on. Note that in the steps in the proof of Proposition 2.1.1, there is a procedure that will allow us to find the Cartesian line through two distinct given points in R2. I will ext extract that procedure and just present it here in this green box. So this is a procedure for um, finding the, the Cartesian line through two given distinct points. You first find the slope of the line, and then you find the y-intercept, and then those things go into this symbol, and they go into this equation. I'll also add a remark. The proof in Proposition 2.1.1 does not address the issue of uniqueness of the line. That is, the proof only shows how you can find a Cartesian line. The proof does not show that the resulting line is the only line that passes through P and Q. But later in this section 2.1 of the book, it, it will be shown that given two distinct points, there is only one Cartesian line that passes through both. That's why in my presentation of the procedure, I use this phrase, finding the Cartesian line passing through two distinct points in R2. So again, in Proposition 2.1.1, they don't claim this is the only one. They just say, here's the way to find a line. But in fact, we'll see later that it is the only line. So that's why I use the word finding the Cartesian line. We'll talk now about the Poincaré plane. The Poincaré plane is this ordered pair. There's a, a, a double struck H that plays the role of points, and then the set of lines is script L with a subscript H. The H re, uh, refers to the word hyperbolic. We'll discuss what's called hyperbolic geometry later in the course. So the Poincaré plane is that ordered pair. Now what is this set double struck H? Well, it's 
the upper half plane in R2. So it's ordered pairs of real numbers with the property that the second coordinate, the y coordinate, is greater than zero. So in these diagrams down below, it would be this set, the set of points above the x-axis. The set of lines denoted by uh, script L, subscript H, contains lines, that is, sets of points of two types. What's called a type 1 line is a line that looks vertical, but I'm not going to call it a vertical line because we've already used that terminology in the Cartesian plane. It's a set of ordered pairs in the, in the upper half plane that have the property that x equals some fixed constant a. And it's denoted this way. Remember that for the Cartesian plane, vertical lines were denoted capital L subscript A on the right. That's a vertical line that goes both above and below the x-axis. In the Poincaré plane, this symbol denotes a type 1 line. It does not go below the x-axis. In fact, it does not intersect the x-axis at all. If you look carefully, there's an open circle here. So that uh, type 1 line is entirely a subset of the upper half plane. It has to be because it's got to be made up of points that live in the upper half plane. And then there are lines that are called type 2 lines. They're denoted by this symbol, a capital L with the subscript C on the left and a subscript R on the right. They're sets of points, so ordered pairs that are in the upper half plane that satisfy this additional requirement. The x and the y satisfy a circle equation. That's a circle centered at c comma zero and of radius r. Now I say circle, it's, it's the upper half of a circle. So a type two line in the Poincaré plane is a very strange looking thing. Well, there's a proposition in the book, Proposition 2.1.2, that uh, proves that this thing, this Poincaré plane, is qualified to be called an abstract geometry. It satisfies the requirements. Now, I won't go through the author's proof of that. It's a nice proof. But I will point out that in the guts of that proof, you can see there are some lines that amount to a procedure for finding the Poincaré line passing through any two distinct points in the upper half plane. So I've extracted that procedure, and I've put it here. Now, notice again, as, as in the case with the procedure for finding the Cartesian line through any two distinct points in R2, I use the word the Poincaré line. In, in the author's proof of Proposition uh, 2.1.2, in the author's proof, they don't claim that this is the only Poincaré line that passes through distinct, two distinct points. That's proven later in the section, though. So later in the section, we'll see that there is only one Poincaré line that passes through two given distinct points. That's why in my presentation here on this page, in, in putting those steps in this green box, I went ahead and used the word the finding the Poincaré line. This issue of how many lines there are through two distinct points, you'll see is going to be important uh, later in this section of the book. Let's consider an example. Let P and Q be those two ordered pairs of real numbers. Question A is, find the equation for the Cartesian line through P and Q. Well, we follow that procedure for finding the Cartesian line passing through two distinct points. We find the slope, we find the y-intercept, and we use them to build this line equation. We denote that uh, line by this symbol, capital L, with subscript on the right. The slope m is there, and the y-intercept b is there. Those two things are separated by a comma in this symbol. Question B, find the equation for the Poincaré line through P and Q. Well, we follow the procedure for finding the Poincaré line passing through two distinct points. 
Now in that procedure, you start by finding the value of C using those formulas from that procedure, and then you find the value of R using formulas from that procedure. And the result is we find out that C is the number 7 and that R is the number square root of 13. So the Poincaré line that passes through P and Q will have this equation, this circle equation. But remember, it's just the upper half of a circle. So you can't just say that that's the line equation. You have to say that it's, it's the point in the upper half plane that satisfy that line equation. And notice that what sits here is not r, but r squared. And this line, this Poincaré line, is denoted this way. The value of c, that number 7, goes on the left. The value of r, that number square root of 13, goes on the right as the subscripts. Now let's illustrate our solutions to A and B with drawings. Well, that Cartesian line will be a straight-looking line with slope m equals negative 1 fifth and y-intercept 0 comma 4. That's shown in this left drawing. The Poincaré line, denoted by that symbol, that'll be the upper half of a circle, centered at 7 comma 0 with radius square root of 13. That's shown in this drawing. I plot those in different axes to make it clear that those, those lines live in different worlds. Now these illustrations, though, need to be clear. Uh, we, we need to be clear ab ab about what these illustrations are telling us. We need to label important points. That's going to include, of course, the points P and Q, but also axis intercepts in the center of the circle. So let's, let's do that. Remember that point P is 5 comma 3. Point Q is 10 comma 2. Uh, the the y-intercept is at 0, 4. And then we should uh, label the x-intercept as well. It's a prominent point, so we should find its coordinates. This line has slope negative 1 fifth and y-intercept 0 comma 4, so it's easy to figure out that this x-intercept is going to happen at 20 comma 0. Now what about this drawing? Well, there's our point P again, and our point Q, 10 comma 2. But there are other things in this drawing that are also very important. So the center of the circle, remember, is at C comma 0, and the value of C is the number 7. So this open circle is located at 7 comma 0. Now what about these points? These are important points. They're, they're not actually part of the line. They're the missing endpoints. But we should label them with their coordinates. Now how do we find the coordinates? Remember that the radius of the circle is square root of 13. So this point has coordinates 7 plus square root of 13, comma 0. And this point on the left has coordinates 7 minus square root of 13, comma 0. So again, when making drawings, you want to make your drawings large and clear and label important features with their x, y coordinates. Okay, that's the end of that example. Now I'm going to talk about the Riemann sphere. The Riemann sphere is this pair. The symbol on the left playing the role of points is uh, the symbol S superscript 2. That denotes this set, the set of triples of numbers that is points in R3, this should say R3, that satisfy this equation. In other words, the unit sphere in R3. Got another typo here. This should say R3. And this symbol on the right, script L subscript capital R, is the set of lines, and it contains lines of this form. Ordered triples of numbers that live on S2 that also satisfy this equation. AX plus BY plus CZ equals 0, where ABC are constants. Now, that thing, a line, a set of that form, is denoted this way. That's a script G with a subscript A comma B comma C. We need to figure out what that means. 
Well, that line denoted by that symbol is going to be the intersection of that unit sphere with a plane through the origin. So we have points that are on the unit sphere that satisfy this equation. That equation is the equation for a plane through the origin in R3. So that set, that's the intersection of the sphere with the plane through the origin, will actually be a circle. Now, all circles that lie on the unit sphere can be described as the intersection of, of that unit sphere with a plane. But not all the planes are planes through the origin. So not all circles that lie on S2 qualify to be called lines in our new uh, Riemann sphere world. So let's consider the picture on the left. All of these blue lines in this diagram would be called lines of longitude on the globe. Each of those is the intersection of the unit sphere with a plane through the origin. But in this diagram, let's look at the middle diagram now, all of these red circles are intersections of the sphere with the plane, but only this one circle, that's the equator, it lies in a plane that goes through the origin. So among all those red circles that would be called lines of latitude on the globe, only that highlighted red circle that's the equator qualifies to be called a line uh, uh, in the Riemann sphere. So again, most lines of latitude are not qualified to be called lines in our set script L, subscript R. Only the equator qualifies to be called a line. Now these are not the only lines. We've seen these lines of longitude that qualify to be called lines, and uh, this one equator that's a line of latitude, the only line of latitude that qualifies to be called a line. But there are other lines as well. Uh, uh, there are circles that, that have a tilt to them, like this one. So there's a tilting line. Now in all these drawings, I, I should have labeled some important points. So in all three of these uh, uh, drawings, there's the North Pole, and the South Pole, and there's a point P that's on the x-axis, and there's a point Q that's on the y-axis, and then I've drawn this point R on the back side as well. Let's go on. Notice some more stuff. This line, script G, subscript A, comma B, comma C, is a circle that lies on the, the unit sphere. And that circle has radius 1, which is the same as the radius of the sphere. Not all circles that lie on S2 are that big. In the pictures above, most of the red circles have radius that it's less than 1. Notice, most of these red circles are not radius 1. They're radius less than 1. Circles that lie on the sphere and have a radius that's the same as the radius of the sphere are called great circles for the sphere. So another way of describing the lines in the Riemann sphere is to say that the lines in the Riemann sphere are the great circles on S2. That's why we use the script uh, capital G in the symbol for the lines. Now the book presents a short proof of this proposition that the Riemann sphere is a model of abstract geometry. I won't discuss the proof of that proposition. It's mainly about solving equations. But it's worthwhile to make an observation about the number of lines that pass through two given points. Uh, the proof of the proposition given in the book shows that given any two distinct points, there's, there exists a great circle on S2 
such that both those points lie on that great circle. That's good. That's one of the requirements that this thing has to satisfy in order to be called an abstract geometry. But the great circle is not always unique. So let's go back up and look at the, the diagram. Notice for points P and Q, there's only one great circle that they both lie on. It's that red equator. But for the points North Pole, South Pole, uh, there is an infinite collection of, of great circles that they both lie on. All those lines of longitude pass through both the North Pole and the South Pole. Now remember that nothing in the definition of abstract geometry forbids that kind of behavior. In, indeed, abstract geometry axiom one says that for any two distinct points, there exists at least one line that both points lie on. If we want to have a geometry that has the property that there's always exactly one line, then we'll need to say that in the axioms of the geometry. We'll see that done later in the, the definition of what's going to be called incidence geometry. That'll be discussed in the next video. Now I want to talk about some additional terminology involving points and lines. First of all, collinearity. We say that a set of points is collinear to mean that there's a line that passes through all the, the points in the set. Now remember that a line is a set of points. So to say that a set of points called capital S is collinear means that there is a line in the set of lines such that that set of points is just simply a subset of that line. Now you're probably comfortable with the word collinear from your past experience. But realize that collinear points can have surprising configurations in abstract geometries. So for example, let's consider these three points, 3 comma 4, 6 comma 5, 10 comma 3. Those are ordered pairs of real numbers. All three of these points lie on a circle of radius 5 centered at the point 6 comma 0. That means they all qualify to be uh, element of the Poincaré line, 6L5. So here are the three points, and they, on, they lie on that line. Now consider these three points, PBQ, 3, 6, 6, 5, 10, 7. Turns out that those lie on a circle of radius 5, that's centered at the point 6, 10. Now that circle is not centered on the x-axis, so it does not correspond to a Poincaré line. So that set of three points is not collinear in the Poincaré plane, whereas this set of points is collinear because there's a Poincaré line that passes through those three points. Now you might ask, well, so that blue circle is not qualified to be called a Poincaré line because it's not centered at the cent on the x-axis, but maybe there is some Poincaré line that, that does qualify that goes through these two, three points. Well, there can't be. Remember from, from previous geometry that uh, in, in the xy plane, given three points that don't lie on a straight-looking line, there is always exactly one circle that passes through all three points. So the only circle that passes through these three points is this one. And it's not centered on the x-axis. So this circle is not part of anything that's qualified to be called a Poincaré line. Now I want to talk about distinct points and distinct lines. To say that points are distinct just means that they're not the same point. To say that lines are distinct means that they're not the same line. Now that may seem silly uh, because A and B are distinct letters. You might assume that that means that they're not the same point. But in fact, you can't assume that just because those are distinct letters that they must necessarily represent different points. There will be some situations where a point A is known to satisfy some criteria and some point B is noticed, known to satisfy some other criteria and you you might find out later that those points A and B are actually the same point. But of course it might turn out that they're distinct points. The same 
situation applies for lines, but it's even richer because lines are sets of points. To say that lines L and M are the same line means that they're equal as sets of points. That is set L equals set M. If there are any points that are on one line and not the other, then the two lines are distinct. So distinct does not mean that they don't touch. It just means that they're not the same set of points. Intersecting lines are defined this way. To say that lines L and M intersect means that the intersection of those sets is non-empty. That's written this way. In other words, there exists at least one point that lies on both lines. So the words L and M do not intersect means that their intersection is the empty set. So to say that two lines do not intersect is different from saying that two lines are distinct. So here's a drawing of two lines that do not intersect. L and M do not intersect. Here's a drawing of two lines that are distinct. Those two lines are distinct. They're not the same set of points. They happen to intersect. There's a point that lies on both, but they're not the same line. Of course, lines that don't intersect also qualify to be called distinct. These two lines are distinct lines as well. To say that two lines are parallel, denoted this way, means that either the two lines don't intersect or they're the same line. So either L intersect M is the empty set or L equals M. So the first possibility looks like this, but it could also look like this could turn out that the symbols L and M both represent the same line. So there's a little subtlety when you say that lines L and M are not parallel. So that's that simple. That means that they do intersect and they're not the same line. So it's the negation of this. So that would be a, a picture like this. Lines that intersect and that are not the same line. Let's go on. I want to talk now about what I call the big questions. There are simply two recurring questions in geometry. Question number one is this. In the geometry, do parallel lines exist? And big question number two is this. Given a line L and given a point P that's not on L, how many lines exist that contain P and are parallel to L? Now remember what parallel means. Parallel means that the lines either don't intersect or they're the same line. Now most of you have probably heard this kind of idea before, and you know that the answer is always one. There's exactly one line that goes through P that's parallel to L. Well, the point is that's not always the answer. In our uh, more general world of geometry that we're studying, the answer to this question can vary depending on the, on the geometry. So in example five, I want to consider the answers to the big questions in some examples of finite abstract geometries. So to start with, consider this geometry, three points, three lines. I won't go through the details that uh, that, that is qualified to be called an abstract geometry, but the, the big question one we can talk about do parallel lines exist? Well, no, because uh, any um, two lines intersect. The red line intersects the green line, and the red line intersects the blue line, and the blue line intersects the green line. So there are no parallel lines. What about the answer to big question two? Big question two is, given a line L and a point P that's not on L, how many lines exist that contain P and are parallel to L? So the configuration could be something like this. This could be the line L, and this could be the point P that's not on L. How many lines pass through P that uh, and are parallel to L? Well, we've already figured out that there do not exist any parallel lines, 
So the answer to the big question too is uh, there are no lines. So you see that any time the answer to big question one is that parallel lines don't exist, then you know the answer to big question two is going to also be no lines. Let's go on. Example B. Consider this geometry. Four points, six lines. What's the answer to big question one? Do parallel lines exist? Well, yes. Uh, notice that this red line is parallel to this green line. Also notice this red line is parallel to this green line. There is no point that lies on both lines. And notice that this red line is parallel to this green line. So the answer to the big question one is yes. Now it would be cool to actually give an example. Instead of just referring to them as the green line or the red line, let's use the symbols for the, for the lines themselves. So you can see in this symbol, for example, why it's clear that these diagonal looking things don't intersect. There is no letter that's in the intersection of those two sets. Now what about the answer to big question two? Given a line L and a point P that's not on L, how many lines exist that pass through P and are parallel to L? Well, you can see in that drawing, uh, there is exactly one line. That line M, maybe we could call it. But it doesn't have to look that way. For instance, what about this line L? If this is the line L, and suppose that's the point P, well, there's still going to be one line M that passes through P and is parallel to L. So the answer to the big question, too, is there's always exactly one line. What about this geometry? This is similar to an example we had earlier in the video, but this geometry has all of these perimeter segments. So that's why I'm using the word geometry. This configuration of points with this larger collection of letters is qualified to be called an abstract geometry. So what's the answer to the big question one? Do there exist parallel lines? Well, yes. Notice that this red line is parallel to this green line. They even look parallel, but that it doesn't have to be that way. Notice that um, this red line is also parallel to that green line. Now you might object. You might say, well, hey, wait a minute. Those lines, if you continued them, would intersect. But no, the, there is no point at that location. So the only thing on this line is points A and B. And the only thing on this line is points C and D. Those uh, two sets of points are disjoint sets. And remember, uh, lines can look like they cross, like that red line crosses that green line in the drawing, but those lines are parallel. There is no point at that location. There's no point there. The only points in this drawing are here. So those two lines don't have a common point. What about the answer to big question two? Suppose I have a given line L and a point P that's not on L. How many lines pass through P that are parallel to L? Well, you can see there is the red line and there's a green line. So in that drawing, there are, are two lines. Now, what if my line L looks like this and my point P is there? Well, then my two lines are gonna be different. There's gonna be that one and there's gonna be that one. And what if my line L looks like this and my point P is down here? Well, still, there are going to be two lines, that one and this one. So we see that the answer is always two lines. That's the end of that example. Let's go on. Let's consider the answer to the big questions in the Cartesian plane. So what's the answer to big question one? Do parallel lines exist? Well, yes, certainly they exist. These two vertical lines, for instance, are parallel. 
What's the answer to the big question two? Um, remember that question is, given a line L and a point P that's not on L, how many lines pass through P and are parallel to L? Well, that's the question that you've all been used to knowing the answer to. It's the, the answer is there's always exactly one line. But it's worthwhile to present the two possible cases and explain why we know that the answer is one. So case one, if you're given a line L that's a vertical line and you're given a point P that's not on L, then the um, that means that the x-coordinate of point P is not the same as the uh, the x-coordinate that describes that line. So that line would be L subscript A. And point P would be x2 comma y2. Well, since P is not on the line, we know that this x-coordinate is not the same as that number. So that means that I can draw a line that's got x-coordinate x2. So this is line L with subscript x2. The vertical line that goes through P is not going to be the same as the vertical line that was given. They're going to be distinct, non-intersecting lines. When L is a non-vertical line, and point P is not on that line, well, then we can uh, we know that line L will be of this form. We can use that same slope M and find a line that goes through P that has the same slope. I discussed the details on this page. So we conclude that the answer to the big question two is there exists exactly one line M that goes through P and is parallel to L. That's this line here, line M. Let's go on. What about the answers to the big questions in the Poincaré plane? What about question one? Do parallel lines exist? Well, certainly, the same, uh, same looking lines as in the previous example, but they're, they're, they're hyperbolic lines, or they're Poincaré lines. So the, the, the symbols are drawn this way with the subscripts on the left but those are still described by the equations x equals 3, x equals 5, just in the upper half plane. So there are parallel lines. Now what about the answer to big question 2? Well, as we did when we answered this question in the Cartesian plane, it'll be useful to consider two cases. Case 1 is when the given line L is a type 1 line, and point P is not on line L, like say maybe over here. Well, clearly there is a, a, a type 1 line that passes through P that does not intersect line L. That's that line. But there are also going to be some type 2 lines that pass through P. Like for instance, this line is a line that passes through P and does not intersect L. But that's not the only one. We can draw more. So there will be many type 2 lines that pass through P and that are parallel to L. All of these lines that I drew, all three of these lines, do not intersect L. So they're parallel to L. What about when the given line L is a type 2 line and point P is not on L? So here's my given line L. And suppose I've got a point P that's not on L. Well, you can see that there there is going to be more than one line that passes through P and uh, does not intersect L. There's a type 2 line that passes through P and does not intersect L. Here's another one. Uh, there's going to be one uh, like this. So there's going to be an infinite set of lines that pass through P and, are, and do not intersect L. So that's the answer to the big question, too in the Poincaré plane. There's an infinite collection of lines that pass through P and are parallel to L. Now what about the answers to the big questions in the Riemann sphere? Well, what about big question one? Uh, do parallel lines exist? 
Well, you might be tempted to say that, yeah, look, these lines are parallel. But remember, those circles are not all qualified to be called lines. The only um, line of latitude that qualifies to be called a line on the Riemann sphere is the equator. Notice that the equator uh, intersects every one of those lines of longitude. And notice that every one of those lines of longitude intersects every other line of longitude. And also remember that there are these other lines on the Riemann sphere that are kind of tilted, lines like that. And you see that that green line intersects every one of those blue lines of longitude. And that green line also intersects the equator. So the takeaway is that there are no parallel lines on the Riemann sphere. And so that means that the answer to the big question two is going to be that given a line L and given a point P that's not on L, there are no lines that pass through P and that are parallel to L. Now how would that look though? Suppose I'm given um, this line that's the equator. Suppose that's my line L. And suppose the point P that I'm given is maybe here. That's a point P that's not on line L. Now try to think of a, a line that passes through P that would not intersect L. Can't be this thing, because remember, that's not a line. That line of latitude is not a line. There's a great circle that's a line of longitude that passes through P, and you can see it intersects L. There's one of those uh, slanting great circles like this, it didn't draw it very well, that goes through P, and it's going to intersect L as well. So there are no parallel lines on the sphere. So the answer to the big question number two is certainly going to be that there are no lines.